So I want to make you anxious tonight. I want to make you feel odd, something that you've never felt. Um, You all think of yourselves in your waking and dreaming hours when your consciousness is working. You all think of yourself as a as a a single individual moving through space and time. And I want to point out to you that that's not right. Um, So just let me point to our place in nature. And so as you see on this slide, this is a slide of the tree of life, as you can see it in the exhibit. Uh, These are the bacteria, and these are archaea, animals whose names tell you that they live in strange environments. Methano uh, bacteria live in in methane environments. Halophiles live in salty environments. Thermophiles live in hot environments and so on. These are bacteria that live in the strangest, single-celled organisms live in the strangest environments. Now these eukaryotes are organisms like yourselves that have cells with nuclei. These don't have cells with nuclei, so these are all have nucleated cells. All of them are single-celled until we get to here. And then we have animals, fungi, and plants. And we are a tiny twig on that little bit called animals, just to put your place in nature. If we scraped all living stuff off the planet, it would be dominated by all the single-celled stuff. And this would just be the Disney World part of life on Earth. This is a mitochondrion. And you have mitochondria in all your cells. And they came from somewhere over here. A long, long time ago, eukaryotes co-opted mitochondria and used them as energy packages in your cells, which the eukaryotes couldn't do themselves. So we have a symbiotic relationship with these things, which are now part of us, and we can't get rid of them, uh, on, on a, in, in an average cell, it m- might make up 15 to 20% of the cell mass, uh, it, depending on how active the cell was. And so you have ancient bacteria living in you, and, and they can't be taken apart anymore. We can't get rid of them because they're essential to our metabolism, and they can't live without us. And then there are bacteria. Uh, all of you have, at the present moment, about four to six pounds of bacteria in your guts alone. There are ten times more bacterial cells in your body than there are of your own cells. So who's a single organism? I mean, are you just carrying them around the world? Because you don't have as many cells in your body that with your DNA as they do. Some of them are essential for your life. You can't live without them. And some of them, of course, turn nasty and can kill you. And and whichever they can do depends upon your present state of health and the vaccinations you had as a child. And then there are viruses. So if there are ten times more bacterial cells in your body than there are your own cells, how many more cells do you think of viruses in and on you? If you've got a cold at the moment, you have a few billion of them every drip full of snot. But even more concern to you than this there are endogenous retroviruses, which is a fancy term for viruses that have lodged in your DNA, and they can't get out. They're part of your DNA now, and you have something like 8% of your whole DNA. That's the stuff that makes you who you are or who you think you are, and 8% of it is endogenous retroviruses. If we add those viruses or those parts of your DNA that have a that have a a reverse transcriptase motif, it's a way of of transcribing DNA, then something like 20% of all your DNA is made of viruses that got there in the past. It's not human DNA at all, except as much as we couldn't be humans without virus DNA. And then there are parasites. Depending where you live, you might have a good roundworm load or a tapeworm. And they are special tapeworms that live in people like you and me. So you see, uh, it's very easy for you to think, and your waking brain tells you, or your dreaming brain, they're both the same, uh, they tell you that you're a single individual, but you've only learned that over your childhood, your early childhood. Very early infants don't know that they're single individuals different from their parents, and they have to learn that, and our consciousness learns that. 
So now I'm going to take you through a little bit of history. So I work at Penn State, so my analogy for time in evolution is a football field. <laughs> so Earth forms, and it's, uh, here is time zero, and it's not until uh, the 40-yard line, your own 40-yard line, that you see anything that's like life, the first signs of life, and these are cyanobacteria, and they changed the planet. They changed the planet because they invented photosynthesis. They could take energy from the sun, and they could turn it into tissues and get rid of oxygen. And that oxygen, which was normally poisonous for life, changed life so that only, anim- only organisms that liked oxygen could survive. And that oxygen persisted and became greater and greater until it eventually rusted all the iron on Earth. The first eukaryotes, things with, cell- with nuclei in their cells, appeared about the 50-yard line. The first things that you would recognize as an animal or plant or something more than a single cell is here on the 12-yard line. The first mammals come in at the six-yard line, the first primates at the two-yard line, and the first humans on the last cuticle of the last blade of grass before you score a touchdown. (laughs) So that's, of course, the Penn State analogy by American football. But you can tell, can't you, by my accent, that American football is not my game. Soccer is my game. This (laughs) This is David Beckham and his wife, Victoria Beckham, commonly known and affectionately known in Britain as Thick and Thin. (laughs) And they do, for me, as two good uh, human beings, nice-looking human beings, with the normal attributes. And I'm going to show you a few of those attributes of them and you, of course, uh, that we share, right? So two eyes, a backbone, three semicircular canals on each side of your head. I'll come back to those later. Jaws, which are easy to understand. Four limbs, two forelimbs, two hind limbs, five digits, three ear ossicles, little bones in your ears that help you hear, the same dental formula, the same numbers and types of teeth, and external testes. And now I'll tell you how old those are in each of you. Not, of course, from the time of your conception and your growth, but in evolutionary time. Half a billion years. Half a billion years, a little less than half a billion years, the same amount of time. We've had three semicircular canals since we've had jaws. Four limbs, 370 million years, five digits, 300 million years. It took 70 million years to settle down on five. The first vertebrates had eight and seven and different numbers. Five was a late pickup, and it's still there with us. Eroscos, 130 million years. You don't need ear ear ossicles in water. Same dental formula, 35 million years. And external testes, about 90 million years. Intelligent design. (laughs) The male gonads in a little sack between your legs, outside. Intelligent design. (laughs) How can that be? You know, of course, right, that most vertebrates don't have the testes outside. Right? And if I asked all the doctors I've trained over my career why you have testes hanging in a little bag between your legs, not safely tucked inside, they'd say, oh, because they have to be cooler than the body temperature. And that's true, but it's the wrong reason. Birds have a higher temperature than mammals, don't they? Have you ever seen bird balls? <laughs> they have them inside where they're safe, which is the straightforward fish amphibian reptile place to put your balls. You don't have them outside hanging in a little sack where they're in danger of being torn off. (laughs) So what is it? Why is it that we've got these out? And the answer only comes from evolution. You can't work it out by brain power. Even MDs can't work it out by brain power. power. So this is a a tree of mammals. It's a very interesting picture because recently morphologists, people like Ian and me, would look at bones and try to work out relationships and we'd get them wrong. And now we have people who work on molecules, the DNA that makes us what we are, and they get it right. So molecular phylogenetic trees work. And so what we find is, now all the mammals on Earth are divided into four main groups. This group in dark green, I happen to give the name Afrotheria to them. And they're animals that include hyrexes, manatees, elephants, aardvarks, elephant shrews, tenrex, and golden moles, and nothing to look, that look like each other, but they all grew up in Africa, all from a common ancestor, and, and are alone. None of the Afrotheres have external testes. 
Go to a game park in Africa with your binoculars, you will not see elephant balls. <laughs> These animals, the xenarthrins, are from South America, armadillo sloths and anteaters. They don't have external testes either. These two groups, this one with a great big long name, Uarchontoglaris, which includes us, they have external testes. And these, the Lorazothiers, they have external testes. And